Hi, I'm Sid. I'm co-founder and CEO at GitLab. And I'm here with uh, Dominic. Uh, Dominic, maybe you can introduce yourself. And before you do that, this call is going to be about remote work, remote management, communication, and team spirit. Take it away, Dominic. Yes. Hi, my name is Dominic. Um, I run a blog at knowhq.co um, where I'm trying to teach founders and managers on how to build a remote company. Um, and it's highly insightful to talk to people uh, like yourself, Sid, um, who kind of went through building a large scale remote organization to learn how they did it and how others can replicate that success. Cool. Um, so, yeah. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, it's always kind of very insightful uh, when we do this. Um, and kind of what's very special about this call is that whenever I'm talking to new founders who are just building a company, they're always saying, oh, we want to make it work like GitLab is making it work or like Zapier is making it work. Um, but GitLab is also, is always kind of the number one example. Um, so maybe to start with a bit of a loaded question is how did you get here or what did it take to get here? Yeah, I think um, when we realized that we were going to be remote, we, uh, we try to um, accommodate for it. Um, so for example, we have, uh, we, we try to make sure that we're intention about, intentional about informal communication. We want to make sure that we stimulate informal communication because that tends to get lost if you're remote. And examples of that I, I can give. Um, the, another thing was that our values are very conducive to uh, working remote. And I, I can give examples of, of that. And maybe a third element is that there was skepticism from our investors where the remote will work. So from a very early start, we were kind of forced to articulate how, how we were uh, accommodating for remote and that helped to maybe spread the word a bit. And maybe that's also why we're one of the better known remote companies now. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. Um, so when exactly uh, did you feel like this is the time to go remote and what was kind of the decision process behind that? Yeah, we're remote because people stopped showing up uh, in the beginning. Uh, there was no office because it was me in the Netherlands, Matt in, in Serbia, and Dimitri in the Ukraine. Later on, I had two desks next to each other. Um, but the Dutch team member who just joined after a few days, uh, they just didn't show up because they could just work from home and everyone else was doing that. So it was natural. And then after I combinated, we got an office. But even also there, like salespeople came in for a few days and then they just one day, like they didn't bother because it wasn't needed. So we've always had the tools and the processes so that you don't miss out. You don't miss out on information and career opportunities uh, when you're remote. And uh, I think people don't necessarily want to go, want to commute. Uh, it's just that people don't want to miss out. So if you don't feel like you're missing out, then um, it's okay. And, and, and a company will naturally become all remote. Cool. What was your kind of biggest issue early on when kind of everyone started not showing up and maybe, maybe I'm, I'm assuming maybe you weren't so prepared, uh, prepared for that scenario. What were big issues in the beginning? The biggest issue was investors. Like one investor we really would like to have as part of, as an investor in a company said, look, you take all the boxes. I believe in everything. The remote thing we've not seen before. It's a risk and very articulate. I'm not saying it's not going to work. I'm just saying that it's a risk and we don't have to take a risk. We can just invest. We have a limited number of investments. We can just invest in a company that doesn't have that risk. Mm -hmm. So they weren't even, they weren't even dismissive of remote. They weren't just saying, Hey, it's not going to work. It's just why take risk when you don't have to. So it made perfect sense from their perspective, but of course we were sad. Mm. Do you feel like that has changed today? I uh, heard from other founders that they kind of had a lot of issues three, four years ago with raising money when being remote and today that might look a little bit different. Yeah, investors today see it as a plus. We have some early investors that were skeptical who are now like, I'm scouting for companies who are all remote because they have a much easier time attracting and retaining talent. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like GitLab might be a reason for that too? 
I'm sure it, it helps. Mm. Cool. So that was in the beginning, probably like a few employees being remote, but now you're, you scaled up uh, a lot more employees. Um, how has that evolved over time? Like nowadays, how do you handle communication? How does everyone stay in the loop? How is that happening at GitLab? Yeah, I think um, one of the ways to kind of know what's going on in the company is our, our group conversations. We have one four days a week. And there's a deck, you can pitch to it yourself. And then it's 25 minutes of Q&A or shorter if the questions run out. I think that's been a great way to kind of show all the different things going on at the company. Uh, so everyone has a feel for what's happening. Um, I think the handbook is, uh, has scaled really well. It's now 3000 pages and wow. w whatever the activity is there, it's a good starting place to kind of find out what you, what you want to do or what you, what you want to, if you want to make a change, that's a great place to change it. I think what hasn't scaled well is our breakout call. So we're trying different things there. And the idea is to give people kind of 20 minutes every day where they just hang out and talk about their life outside of work with a diverse set of people. What is working is team socials where you hang out with your team, but I'm really afraid of teams becoming isolated from each other. So I would love for there also to be a cross-functional group of people you interact with frequently. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like being in quotation mark limited to these communication tools, let's say chat and, you know, handbooks and video chat. Um, do you feel like that's difficult or that there are issues that you wouldn't have if everybody was in a big office and just hanging uh, together all the time? No, I actually think it's more effective. If I compare the video calls I have with people with in-person meetings, uh, every video call we have, we have a Google Doc on the side. It has like the questions that we should discuss. It has the notes, the follow-up actions. And having that kind of in real time is such a benefit. It's like a real time kind of whiteboard, magic whiteboard. Now we, we do have to type that ourselves, but it is an amazing thing and I really miss it. Also, we don't spend a lot of time kind of we don't have people late for meetings. We start on time. We end on time. Uh, it, it enforces a discipline that's just much more effective. So I don't see it as a downtime. I think uh, it's great, except like obviously it's still meetings, so it can't accommodate for time zones. I think time zones are the bane of our existence. And mm -hmm. uh, we try to do as much work asynchronous as we can to accommodate for that. Where... I know that um, a lot of people at GitLab are also in the U.S., everywhere in the U.S., um, but you have people all around the world. So um, to come back to these time zones, um, how do you kind of overcome that when you have meetings crossing the U.S., Europe, Asia? Um, how do you kind of put a bigger meeting together? Yeah, so the solution is to not have the meeting. And two of our top three values are conducive in that. One of the values is transparency. So we write things down. So you don't have to kind of shoulder tap someone and ask them. The other one is iteration. We take small, tap, small steps really quickly. If you take a small step, you don't need to coordinate with as many people. If you have a six month project, you better make sure everyone's aligned. If you get it out in two weeks, you can just go ahead. And then if you're really off, you can compensate the next two weeks and, and steer it. Uh, in a slightly different direction. I, we kind of already talked a little bit about that, but how do you promote um, kind of good, healthy company culture and people talking to each other outside of work when everything's limited, again, in quotation marks, to video chats and... Yeah, and, uh, yeah we, talked, so. we talked about the breakout call already. We talked um, about team socials. Another thing we do is coffee chats. If you join GitLab, we uh, require you to do 10 coffee chats where you schedule 25 minutes with a team member, uh, but you don't have an agenda. You can talk about work or things outside of work. Um, mm -hmm. We also do try to get people together. So we do local meetups. We do a company-wide meetup. We pay for travel if you visit other team members. Um, so we try to 
try to make it a social experience. Mm -hmm. um, so you talked about team retreats. What's usually happening uh, when you have such a, a big meetup like in your, in your background right now? Yeah. So we've seen a lot of other companies who do death by PowerPoint where you have to sit to hours and hours of presentations. So we don't do that. We have an opening and a closing event, but the entire rest is excursions. We go visit new places together and um, an unconference. Subjects put on the agenda by individual contributors, groups of no more than 15 people discussing that without a presentation. Mm -hmm. And what do you see as the biggest benefit um, out of those team retreats, usually for socializing or is it um, also, for, you know, team building that people get to know each other. People get to know each other. People get to know more of each other outside of work. And they realize that they're surrounded by a whole lot of people who are uh, on their best behavior. And sometimes that get, gets a bit lost if you're just going back and forth in chat. Right. Um, I feel like it might be a quote by uh, Andreas Klingler who said um, that kind of remote is for, for iteration and meetups and face-to-face um, -face time is for innovation. Do you agree with that? I, I think it's a false, false dichotomy between iteration and innovation. I think if you look at the really innovative things that have happened, they have not been a big top-down plan. They've been people iterating their way out of a maze and just ending up at a different thing than they expected in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And what's also a big issue, what people have told me is kind of having these breakout ideas, like just coming up with it with a quick idea or a quick innovation. Do you feel like that's um, an issue or do you do anything to promote just like random brainstorms, ideas, innovations? I think it's happening enough. Don't like, for example, today, I let's call it the brain fart about the monitoring and we just started a recording and Eric and JJ are going to upload that um, or they maybe already uploaded that and we just put it on YouTube, mm -hmm. YouTube on the GitLab and filter channel. So there's enough ways to kind of write up an idea. We get an issue tracker with over probably 10,000 feature proposals. There's no lack of ideas on how to improve things. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like GitLab is always very transparent also with this meeting? And as you said, everything's recorded and gets uploaded or written down. Do you think that's a crucial part uh, when there are so many people and everything's remote that everything is transparent? Um, I think it helps. I think it, the hardest thing about remote is not so much the remote part, but the time zone part because of time zones, you need to go asynchronous and to go asynchronous, you need to start recording so that you can time shift when it happens with when people view it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so when, when meetings are happening, what are usually the cases where you would prefer, prefer a meeting face-to-face -face over uh, written down or chat? Um, written down or chat. I don't, like, I think in person, I would contrast in person with video calls. I think okay. anything work-related can be a video call. I think mm -hmm. in person is great to break bread together, to get to know each other on a personal level, to kind of free will a bit. Any meeting that has like an agenda, which most meetings should have, and where you do note taking, I prefer a video call. Mm -hmm. So you already touched a little bit on having an agenda. What are your tips or your advice on making meetings more efficient, especially in a remote setting? Uh, start on time. Um, have the questions in there on time, start answering the questions ahead of time. Like frequently we have like only half of the stuff we need to discuss in the meeting because asynchronously before the meeting, people were putting in questions and answers. Yeah. Lots of links to like, here's where you can find more information. So don't, don't just give the answer, also teach people how to fish where, where, where this was located in the first place. Um, we find it really helpful that people put in their questions and we go in that order through the meeting. So if you want to ask something, it's always a bit awkward in remote meetings, like raising your hand and things like that. And you get uh, like the highest paid person to, to ask more questions. It, it's a democratization if it's just in the order in which the questions were asked. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, kind of indents the answers below that. And also, if it's a meeting with seven people and there's just two people going back and forth, 
yeah. spin it out of the meeting, say, hey, we'll solve mm-hmm. this with the two of us. Right. Do you ever feel like you're losing a bit of flexibility because you can't just call anybody in a meeting right now? I can. I did. Uh, I called Darren four minutes before this meeting started. <laughs> right. But you're not sitting with a person in an office and can just say, say, hey, everybody come in. Like somebody might be in a way different time zone and asleep. We're, we're, yeah. So async is hard. But like in a thousand person company, it's easier to, it, it might take four, more than four minutes to get to someone's desk. Right. Um, so I think it's really flexible. Yeah. And we can solve for time zones. Time zones are hard. Right. So let's yep. change the topic a little bit and get to hiring. Uh, that's Wait. kind of the set. Cool. set. Before that, Darren, I think, wants to add something. Yeah, I was mm-hmm. just going to say that uh, Sid and I are about 3,000 miles apart right now. And he was able to bring me into this meeting uh, probably a lot more quickly than if we were in the same co-located space. He doesn't know what floor I'm on. He doesn't know if I'm already in a meeting. Um, right. He can just slack me. And if I'm available, I'm able to jump in. So um, I think in many ways it's actually easier. Uh, if, you know, if they're not available, they're not available. But in, you, at the Facebook right. headquarters, you take about half of your meetings over video call because it takes too much time. It takes ten minutes to go between offices. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. I agree. And you spend two hours a day in a bus to get to the headquarters. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Come with this. It's a ridiculous situation. Come on, yeah. we, we can all see that the, the thing is better. Um, just have to accommodate for it. Mm-hmm. And like, if there's no if there's no doc attached to a meeting, uh, I will I will join the meeting and I will sh- shut down the meeting one minute in. Mm-hmm. And I expect all of my everyone in the company to do exactly the same thing. Mm-hmm. So, people's time is really valuable, and you should take it very seriously if you. Uh-huh. make a demand on that time and that's not only limited to remote companies right like in in the best uh, in the best case every company should do that exactly remote forces you to do the things you should be doing anyway earlier and better right yeah that's something i, I hear a lot that remote companies do things that large companies should do but they do it a lot earlier and they have to do it to do exactly. something out of it right so yeah, um, the second part is more about hiring. That's another bigger problem that uh, a lot of early stage companies have um, because you, you put um, a position out and it's not only available to people in your city, it's not only available to um, kind of people who are ready to move to that city, it's technically available to the whole world. So um, a lot of companies get a lot of um, applications on every position, um, how, what could you suggest to filter? Let's say you have a position out there and you get a thousand applications from all around the world. Um, what do you usually do to filter some of these? Yeah, first let's note how amazing that is, right? Most companies have the problem and nobody's interested. Right. Uh, you filter, uh, yes, it's very regular. You look at people's resume, you filter first step on that, then a screening call and then the, an interview process with a, four to five uh, calls and then references. Mm -hmm. Is that how a standard hiring process at GitLab would look like too? Yep. And at the bottom of most job families, you can find the exact Mm -hmm. information and and how many rounds of interviewing there will be. Right. Are you testing for remote readiness at all or attributes that you could attribute to a, a good remote worker? No, we uh, regularly hire people who've never worked remote before and we haven't found any problems. Um, Mm -hmm. What's important that is people are a manager of one. They can manage their own time. They don't need someone to tell them what to do on a day-to-day basis, but they can, they're disciplined about that and they they can handle a higher level of kind of input from their manager. Is that something that you actively look out for? Is it something that people can kind of learn on the job and grow into? it's we're not doing a good enough job filtering on that yet um but i don't i think we want to hire people who already have demonstrated that Mm -hmm. and uh what's kind of more of an administrative question is people don't know how to hire remote employees so what's the case maybe it's it has changed over the years at gitlab but how are 
people actually hired at GitLab? Are they contractors? Are they actually hired locally? And what would you suggest to a startup, maybe 20, 30 people to how to do that? Yeah. So we got entities like companies, subsidiaries of GitLab Inc. in uh, companies where we have a lot of team members. So 80% of our team members are working, uh, are regular employees. In 80% of the countries in which we have team members, people are contractors. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And then there's the second um, kind of issue, which is especially if you have multiple entities with kind of taxes, um, hiring people in different states, especially in the US, especially early on, how did you figure those things out? And what is maybe the, the number one Kuwait which you found, which you would suggest to every new founder to look out for? Um, so in the beginning, in the US, we dealt with it through Trinet, their co-employer, and it makes it easy to hire people in all kinds of states. And it wasn't a big deal. And we got a great benefits program and you pay like 10% extra, but it's worth it. You kind of, if you have more than a hundred people, you probably should take it, take it on yourself again, but it was a great benefit. And there's more uh, great companies now helping with that, like Gusto. Um, they now do payroll as, as well as benefits. Right. Yeah. And I don't, I don't think there's a, yeah, you should look into the local laws and regulations and things like that, but I don't think there's any major caveats we, we had very few problems with all of this. Okay. Um, just make sure you're, you're a good employer. You do things that good employers do. Mm -hmm. And maybe for just some additional, more general questions. Um, is there a big issue at GitLab in terms of remote working, which you, in, in your mind, still weren't able to solve to this day? Something kind of big that's still a thorn in your eye? Um, remote things we haven't solved. Yeah, time zones. Like we do that group conversation every day at a fixed time and the people in Asia Pacific cannot join that. So I want to make sure that our group conversations start like being at different times. Um, but we found before that if we start shifting the time of certain events, the attendance drops dramatically because people can no longer fit it into their day. Okay. So that's, that's a big problem still to be solved. Mm -hmm. And do you feel like after all those years um, that you had a really bad experience with remote work where you felt like it would have been better if we would sit, all sit in an office somewhere? Not really. I think that um, digital nomads that stay at um, kind of backpacker hostels have a super hard time being disciplined mm -hmm. about their work. So I'm skeptical yes. of that, but I'm, I'm supportive of, of nomads. Um, we mm -hmm. have people and uh, Dave, we just talked about someone who's traveling America in an RV. I think it makes total sense. But if you surround yourself with people that are partying day in, day out, that, that's not conducive to getting work done. Mm -hmm. What do you do at GitLab to maybe promote um, people having more, a more structured day and not just going partying all day? Uh, that's none of our business. Um, okay. It's just that it seems hard, but people should make their own choices. We'll judge them. Our number one value is results. We don't care about how many hours you work or how you work. We care about your output. We're going to measure that. Mm -hmm. So do you do anything to make sure that your employees don't overwork or get burned out, yeah, uh, which is often an issue for remote workers? That's a great one. So the only time a manager is allowed to inquire about how many hours you work is when they suspect you're working too many hours. Okay. And what happens if somebody works, let's say, 15 hours per day? Well, that's ridiculous. But uh, <laughs> if it, if, even working eight hours a day, you can get overworked. Um, yeah. It's not just about the hours. It's also about motivation, lots of other things. But um, managers are responsible for kind of their reports. And if they, they suspect someone is not doing well working, getting burned out or working too long hours, it's, it's a conversation and there's different things up to the point where they mandate time off. Mm -hmm. But that hopefully you can catch it earlier, have a conversation. And many times it's a misunderstanding of the 
the manager not realizing what workload they were demanding or um, miscommunication leading to kind of a lack of motivation mm -hmm. or especially new team members thinking that they should work crazy hours because they did that at the last startup. Mm -hmm. Is that still a big issue for, for GitLab to have people kind of overworked and burned out because you know, it might be a change from having a commute and being in an office from to just working from home and having it accessible all, at all times? I, I think that uh, like uh, work-life separation is an issue if you work from home. So mm -hmm. I think that's, that's something that a lot of people in the company are struggling with. Um, I do not think that we have a lot of people burning out. Um, I've seen way worse things at other startups, but at our global get together, um, the two most popular subjects in the unconference were one lack of motivation and second burnout. So yeah, this is, this is stuff we talk about and that we use those global back gatherings to, to discuss. What's your best advice for remote workers to keep that work-life balance if they have a home office, for example? Yeah, um, make sure, if, you, if you have that luxury, make sure it's a separate room. At GitLab, we don't force you to work from home. If you want to work from an office, we'll pay for that. So if that helps you, we'll pay for it. You can probably find an office space pretty close by so you don't have to commute long. Mm -hmm. A lot of people who it's their first time remote working they first do the office thing uh, so that um, their family gets adjusted to it yeah. uh, because it's it's hard for people to realize especially for children but even for spouses that hey you're home but you're working um, mm -hmm. so that's something that builds over time um, and then also enjoy enjoy the benefits of your kids barging in on a meeting and distracting mm -hmm. you it's the best distraction in the world what's for you um as also a remote worker what's the best benefit for you um being remote um kind of location independent um i get more done um i think there's just a natural inefficiency to kind of traveling between meetings and the scheduling and all the other things to take i regularly have in-person meetings and I regularly get about half the efficiency out of that that mm -hmm. I get from uh, virtual meetings. And there's, there's, yeah, there's just freedom. Like if in GitLab, if a meeting isn't interesting to you, you just go to your email or Facebook on the site. You're mm -hmm. the boss of your, where you pay attention and it's, it's not shameful to say, Oh, I, I wasn't paying attention. Can you repeat the question? That's totally cool. Right. I think that's a common, uh, common view that remote workers tend to have more responsibilities and more kind of being their own manager than uh, a co-located worker. Do you see kind of the same thing in your team? Yep. And I think it's the future of work. Like mm -hmm. you want to, you want eh, highly talented people who can take responsibility for their own job. Does it make sense to have like project managers that ask people where they are and then tell them to do more without like helping them and coaching them and doing those things. So mm -hmm. no project managers, no, you have to pay attention to this meeting stuff. Let people be the boss of their own time and hold them accountable for results. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's amazing to see how that's not happening at other companies. It, it sounds, right. this sounds very obvious, but then you look around at, at, a, at almost every other company and then not doing this effectively. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Um, when you kind of in your company, what's your kind of tool stack specifically to remote work? You said you have you have a handbook, um, but when you're doing meeting, when you're communication uh, communicating, um, what's kind of the tool stack that you yeah. that you use? Use uh, Slack. We use Google Docs for those meeting notes. We use Zoom for video calling. It's amazing. Then we use Google issues to plan. We use Google or sorry, Google <laughs> GitLab merge requests to uh, plan our uh, to do our code. GitLab issues to plan things. GitLab epics for portfolio management and GitLab pages to store things like our website and our handbook. Mm -hmm. So would you would you even say that GitLab is now more than 
uh, you know, version control and all the, the other sectors and more also a tool for remote companies? No, I think, I think GitLab is still, it's a single application for the entire DevOps life cycle. It's a single, it's a DevOps platform del delivered as a single application all mm -hmm. the way from planning what you want to do, creating that, but also packaging, rolling that out, monitoring and securing and defending that. So mm -hmm. we're GitLab as a product is not, is not tied into remote and 90 plus percent of our revenue is coming from co-located companies. Right. What do you think about, um, I, th I think a lot of these tools that you mentioned, they're very kind of standard in remote companies. A lot of them are using them. Um, and they weren't specifically engineered for remote work. They just really, they work really well for that use case. Um, what do you think about the specifically engineered for remote work tools that are coming up now? Yeah, um, I'm, uh, I'm intrigued, let's see. I've seen a lot of like virtual office tools. We have virtual meeting rooms and stuff like that. I don't think that makes sense. Yeah, we're gonna meet in a URL. Like people get that, that it's not a problem. Mm -hmm. it's, they're trying to solve a problem that doesn't need to be solved. There's cool new startups like Tendum. We're trying to integrate more. And uh, so let's see how, how they do. Um, we have very curious people at GitLab, so I'm sure some people will check it out and I will not hesitate to tell other people if it's, uh, if it's good. Do you feel like there's still one, one tool missing in kind of a workflow of a remote company? Something that would be nice to have on a day-to-day -day basis? It's a great question. I don't think so. I think the video calling has been such so bothersome. So the, la the last missing piece was uh, Zoom. Mm -hmm. We're now hitting a, the limit a bit of Google Docs, like at like a certain amount of people, you cannot edit anymore. You say too many people are viewing this document. So I hope they kind of up that limit a bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be a nice limit to lift. Um, so yeah, for, for kind of closing up, um, as the last question, what would be um, the number one advice you can give to a new fresh company that's just starting out and is, is looking to build their team um, fully remote? Yeah, read our handbook and copy from it or two, uh, please. <laughs> that's a great, great uh, answer. Um, yeah, that's it from my side um, in terms of questions. Uh, thank you so much for, for taking this. I think it was very insightful. Um, and I think it's, it's also something that can help a lot of people um, who are, as I said, just starting out now, um, building a small remote team um, to kind of knowing what's getting to them because there aren't too many companies out there, especially at, at your size, uh, who are being remote and kind of pioneered this whole thing and uh, figured these things out on kind of the hard way. Um, so this was really a really nice talk. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. And we hope Old Remote becomes popular, not in the least, because it hopefully will spread opportunity a bit more equally around the globe. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.